Emily Cleveland, can you speak yet? Take that as a no. Good afternoon, everyone. I will now call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Government Operations back to order. My name is Rylan Johnson. I'm the MLA for Yellowknife North and chair of this committee. On behalf of the Standing Committee on Government Operations, I would like to welcome officials from the Office of the Auditor General today to present the 2021-2022 public accounts. And uh, before we begin, I just want to note that it is December, so this is the earliest we have ever reviewed the public accounts, and I, I hope uh, future committees will uh, try and do this timeline, and we appreciate all the work both at the GNWT level and the Office of the Auditor General in you know, making sure we can do this in this timely manner. It, it really helps uh, review of main estimates when we've done it before at the next budget. I also want to note that this will be this committee's uh, final review of the public accounts, so just thank you to everyone. and. Uh, we will have a number of recommendations for, for the next committee and hope they carry on all of the work and uh, whoever they may be. So uh, with that, I will begin by asking uh, MLAs to introduce themselves, beginning on my right. Uh, Frida Martellos, MLA for Tabacha. Rocky Simpson, MLA for A River South. Thank you, and any members who are joining us virtually? Uh, we are joined by MLA Cleveland Online and MLA at Jericho. And I will uh, make sure that they, uh, we get any technical difficulties, they may sort it. But uh, with that, uh, Ms. Miller, Assistant Auditor General, I'll turn it over to you to provide any opening remarks and introduce your staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss our audit of the consolidated financial statements of the Government of the Northwest Territories for the 2021-22 fiscal year. I want to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional unceded territory of the Yale Knives Dini First Nation. I'm accompanied by Lana Dar, who is responsible, uh, who is a principal responsible for the audit, and Kelsey Hogg, who was the director. As the government of the Northwest Territories Auditor, our primary responsibility is to audit the government's consolidated financial statements and express an opinion on them. As legislative auditors, we also report on the government's compliance with financial and legal authorities, such as the Financial Administration Act. The committee's review of the public accounts on the government of the Northwest Territories is an important step in ensuring accountability and transparency for how public funds are spent and how government finances are reported. I am pleased that the committee is holding this hearing to examine the government's financial results shortly after the release of the, con of the consolidated financial statements. The government carries out its accounting and financial reporting responsibilities through the Office of the Comptroller General within the Department of Finance. The Comptroller General will answer questions about the preparation of the financial statements. We will focus on our audit. Our independent auditor's report is on pages 10 to 13 of section one 
of the public accounts of the government of the Northwest Territories. We have issued an unmodified audit opinion on the consolidated financial statements. They conform in all material, material respects with the Canadian public sector accounting standards, which means that the information in the statements is reliable. The consolidated financial statements, which include the accounts of the government and its controlled entities, show that the government had a net debt of $1.37 billion as at March 31, 2022. Net debt is a key financial indicator. This is the amount by which the government's liabilities exceeds its financial assets. Being in a net debt position means that the government will need to take action in the future to rebalance its finances. In preparing financial statements, the government has to make estimates and assumptions that affect the amount it reports. The government significant areas of measurement uncertainty are disclosed in the notes to the financial statements. As these amounts are estimated, it is possible that an amount appearing in the government's financial statements could significantly change in future years. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, our auditors conducted the audit remotely again this year we were able to carry out sufficient and appropriate audit work on which to base our conclusions by using technology and maintaining good communication with the government departments and public agencies. More recently, we have resumed traveling to the territory to conduct our work. I would like to thank the Comptroller General, the Deputy Minister of Finance, and the staff of the departments and public agencies who were involved in preparing the government's financial statements. Mr. Chair, this concludes my opening remarks. We would be pleased to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. Uh, and I will open it up to the floor to any questions or comments from committee members. I will begin. Uh, I, I, I'm just curious, the uh, committee has previously made some recommendations to publish the public accounts earlier. Uh, and, and I understand that it's you know, not necessarily an easy task. It requires rolling up a number of entities. But I, I, I'm just wondering from the Office of the Auditor General's perspective, you know, to kind of incrementally work toward that, what would be the key areas that uh, GNWT and your office would need to focus on. I'll be asking Ms. Dar to respond to this question. Ms. Dar? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, I believe that was a question that we discussed with committee the last time we were here, um, and certainly advancing the timeline of completion of the public accounts would increase uh, transparency and accountability. So it is a goal um, that we would like to work with the um, Office of the Comptroller General to achieve. So on an incremental basis, I would say the most significant piece is the coordination and compilation of the information from the departments and all of the public agencies that are consolidated. Um, we can certainly work on improving the consolidation timeline as well, but I do believe that that is um, you know, at a fairly efficient level. So the consolidation timeline, I don't think is one in which is going to significantly get us to being able to report earlier. So it's really gonna be at the detail level with the departments closing their books, um, having that information available for the Department of Finance to compile to be ready for the end consolidation process. Um, certainly last time we noted that the auditors of all the public agencies, one of which is the OAG, um, but there's also some other um, public firms that are involved in those audits, would need to coordinate together on those timelines to make sure that the required audits are done. Um, so I guess to, uh, for our perspective, that is the biggest challenge, is to be able to move those timelines up. So the year ends are what they are. Um, so it's about the time that it takes in between the year end and having closed books ready for audit or review and submission um, is the key. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the committee? Emily Simpson. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, in uh, the opening statement there, it was noted that the uh, net debt position for this government is $1.37 billion. So in, the audit, uh, in your audit, did you find anything to confirm that this government has identified any solutions to address this debt position? Or, was, or is that within your mandate? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Miller? Mr. Chair, um, so in terms of the member's question, we will audit uh, the public accounts of the consolidated financial statements. In terms of reviewing of solutions, um, this is not within our mandate. Thank you. Any follow-up, Emily Simpson? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, these are uh, predominantly federal dollars that uh, we are dealing with. So I just want to get a sense, I guess, uh, and maybe this isn't within your mandate either, is whether or not you look at uh, uh, value for uh, dollar that are spent. Is that something that uh, uh, is within your mandate? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Miller? So as part of our office, uh, we do conduct uh, what we would call value for money audits. Uh, based on uh, the committee's view of what is most important in terms from a risk perspective and um, list, in terms of what the committee would like to concentrate its efforts on uh, in terms of priorities and therefore if the committee wishes us to provide a value for money audit they can request it as part of that process. Thank you. Any follow up on Uh No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was curious, uh, the, the first time we see kind of program level detail is when the, the budget gets tabled and, and we'll see the actuals for the last fiscal year aligned with each single budget line item. And, and I guess the problem with that is that by that point we're kind of in a budget fight about future spending and no one's interested in looking what's past. Uh, that's really when the public accounts are going focus on that. I'm curious from the Office of the Auditor General's perspective whether that would be feasible at some point in you know, the kind of non-consolidated public accounts to publish that program level detail or whether any other jurisdictions do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so from a budgeting perspective, uh, our office doesn't get involved in terms of auditing budgets. We'll audit expenses. Um, I believe uh, the question is an in-period type of monitoring that would be helpful for the committee members to be able to see what the picture of the finances of the government looks like. That's maybe a discussion with the comptroller. Um, we do not typically audit uh, quarterly or interim uh, financial statements within the context of our the entities we audit from a federal to a territorial level, we will audit the annual, but this is definitely something maybe uh, the committee might want to ask the comptroller about. Thank you. Uh, any further questions, comments from committee? Emily Simpson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, talk about the NTHSSA. And uh, the health is, uh, is, is so important to the NWT and to the residents and the, of the NWT. We've seen the deficit for the NTHSSA uh, quadruple uh, since uh, the amalgamation. Uh, the only uh, uh, organization that didn't amalgamate was the Hay River Health Authority, Authority which is actually running the surplus, I understand. And uh, I think it was mentioned at one point uh, is that, uh, you know, what's the longevity, I guess, of the NTHSSA? Uh, you know, without the federal government, without their support, uh, if this was a business, it would be defunct by now. So is the, uh, or is does the OAG uh, work with the GNWT on the sustainability plan that they're looking at. Is that something that you have input into or suggestions? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Miller? Chair, I'll direct this question to Ms. Starr. 
is not involved in working on the sustainability plan. It's an NTHSSA initiative that they're working in collaboration with the Department of Health and Social Services. Um, working on the strategy broad scope um, for such a plan is outside of the scope of the financial audit, which our team is representing today. However, as Ms. Miller noted, um, another part of the Auditor General's mandate is on the value for money and performance audit area. So that is much broader, and um, we can certainly scope in areas that are um, of interest to committee um, and of the government to look at. So the, the magic in terms of the performance audit is about finding the right timing to come in to do an audit. Um, is it early on before the sustainability plan is actually um, developed, or do you want to have a look at it after? Um, to see if it's been effective and whether accountability is built into the plan itself and has actually been um, found its way to be measured. Those are kind of all areas that our performance audit practice can actually um, bring to the table in terms of reporting back um, to committee or whoever it is that requested the audit in the first place. But in terms of our annual audit that we do, we really just audit the actual results that has happened, what has been spent, we can definitely give you um, our perspective on the growing deficit and what it means in terms of cash flow and budgeting and some of the concerns in terms of viability in the future in the absence of more and continued um, contributions at the territorial and at the federal level. Those are kind of the, the number issues that we can provide on an annual basis. Thank you. Any follow up, Emily Simpson? Uh, just comment, I guess, is that, uh, you know, value for dollar, I think, is important. I think the people of the NWT have to, you know, be confident that, you know, the money uh, being spent is, uh, is, you know, they're getting the services that, that they were promised. And so often we hear that's not the case. So I think it's important that, you know, uh, this committee and, uh, and, and this government uh, look at undertaking a review to s make sure that we are are getting that value, and if we're not getting that value, why aren't we get, getting the value, and how can we make changes? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions, comments from the committee? Uh, I guess I have one. I, I see our environmental liabilities have increased by about $20 million. Uh, I'm curious if the Office of the Auditor General has uh, knows an explanation for that and, and you know this is obviously an area that is increasing somewhat consistently I'm wondering if there are any trends in this area kind of you know beyond just our territory thank you so I'll direct the question to Mr. Hogg Mr. Chair Hogg thank you Mr. Chair the 20 million dollar increase this year <clears throat> in the environmental liabilities was largely due to an accrual for the Cameron Hills oil and gas site uh, the government accepted responsibility for some uh, abandonment work of wells on the site in accordance with an indemnification agreement previously signed with the receiver responsible for the site. Uh, in terms of trends, uh, I guess what I can say is that the note 20 to the financial statements does disclose that there are contingent environmental liabilities. There are sites out there for which no amount has been recorded because at this point in time, either the associated costs that those, those sites may result in and or the government's obligation for the cost is currently not determinable. So it's certainly possible that as circumstances change or new information comes to light, that there could be adjustments in the future that could increase the liability. Thank you, Mr. Hogg. Any further questions, comments from the committee? Hearing none, uh, thank you very much for your presentation and thank you, committee. Uh, we will take a short recess and uh, get the Office of the Comptroller General in front of us.
Uh, thank you. Uh, I will call this meeting back to order on behalf of the Standing Committee. Uh, I'd like to welcome officials from the Office of the Comptroller General. Uh, Ms. Mugen, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself and your staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Julie Moyton. I'm the Comptroller General for the GNWT. And with me today is Mr. Celestino O, who's the Assistant Comptroller General. And also with me is Mr. Glenn Burns, who's the Manager for, for Financial Reporting, and Ms. Lindsay Dempsey, who's the Senior Reporting uh, Advisor. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll now turn it over to you. Begin with your presentation and any remarks you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So good afternoon, and thank you for inviting us before committee to discuss the 2022 pub Consolidated Public Accounts of the Government of the Northwest Territories. The public accounts is a key accountability and transparency reporting mechanism of the GNWT and presents the financial position and the results of the operations of the Consolidated Government Reporting Entity for the fiscal year. And as the public accounts can be very technical, the Department of Finance again this year published with the release of the public accounts, a refresh format of the financial highlights document that provides re readers a summarized version of the public accounts. The consolidated public accounts are audited by the Office of the Auditor General of Canada, and the auditor's report again this year provides a clean opinion. In terms of the financial highlights, the 2022 consolidated public account report that revenues were 2.6 billion and expenses were 2.57 billion, which resulted in an operating surplus of 62 million. And during the year, the GNWT invested 261 million in capital infrastructure. Overall borrowing as defined by the NWT Borrowing Act was 1.22 billion, which resulted in the government's residual borrowing capacity being 584 million at March 31, 2022. The public health emergency declared by the government in response to the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the government's fiscal results for the year ended March 31, 2022. And given the materiality of this event, a separate note was included in the public account starting in 2021. So in 21-22, there were revenues of 40 million and expenditures of 118 million related to COVID-19 impacts. And again, these, again this year, these include costs for health and safety measures taken and expenditure for economic recovery in the form of financial support programs, as well as transfer payments from the government of Canada. And I would like to acknowledge the finance teams across every government department and agency for their contributions to the on-time completion of these financial statements. And that concludes my opening remarks, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there, sorry, were you going to walk us through your presentation? So today um, on slide two, I'd like to walk you through the financial highlights in a bit more detail, the financial impacts of COVID-19, um, the calculations of the fiscal responsibility policy for the year ended, and future accounting standards that we haven't covered previously. So on slide number three, we have the financial highlights. So starting with revenues, revenues were 135 million higher in 2022 due to a higher grant from Canada because of the gross expenditure base increase and increased corporate and personal income taxes and higher general revenue. Operating expenses were 163 million higher, primarily as a result of the impact of COVID-19 expenditures, 2021 flood recovery assistance, and collective agreement increases. And this resulted in an annual surplus of $60 million. Financial assets were $691 million. Um, the increase was due to higher cash balance at year end. Liabilities were $2 billion, uh, which was an increase from the prior year, resulting from higher deferred revenue, offset in part by paying down P, um, uh, P3 liability. And net debt was 1.37 billion at year end. Non-financial assets were 3.8 billion, which was an increase uh, from last year of 96 million, primarily due to an increase in tangible capital assets. On slide four, we cover the financial impacts of COVID-19. So similar uh, note uh, to last year. And so overall revenues were 39.5 million um, with expenses of 118 million. And this can be found in note 24 of the public accounts. So on slide five, we show here the fiscal responsibility policy calculations. And so this chart is from our financial statement discussion analysis section. 
Um, what we show here is that the provisions of the finance, fiscal responsibility policy have been met for the fiscal year 21-22. So infrastructure investments, excluding P3, met the required 50% minimum operating surplus generated from the non-consolidated public accounts. And the non-consolidated Consolidated debt servicing costs are 1.6% of the non-consolidated revenue, which is less than the 5% limit. And so on to future accounting standards, um, two new standards we wanted to uh, raise that have not been previously mentioned are uh, PS3400 revenue, which comes into effect on April 1, 2023. Um, guidance on how to account for and report on revenue depending on uh, whether the transactions include performance obligations. Um, our review of this accounting standard is that there will be no significant impact on the consolidated financial statements as a result. And the second standard is PSG8, which is pur purchased intangibles. This is also effective April 1, 2023, and we don't foresee any impacts, but we wanted to bring them to committee's attention. And these are also included in the public accounts. And finally, the Department of Finance ongoing work of the public accounts. So continued focus on the implementation of new accounting standards. As you know, uh, asset retirement obligations is a large accounting standard uh, change that we are implementing. Of course, continuous improvements of the content and quality of the information uh, included not just in the financial statement discussion analysis section, but also in our note disclosures. Um, as committee will acknowledge, there have been a number of additions to the public accounts over the last years uh, to increase the value for readers um, uh, and provide more information. And the Department of Finance remains committed to working on future enhancements to the public accounts and recommendations from committee. Thank you, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Mewchen. Uh, are there any questions from committee? Uh, Emily myself, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to ask the question about the handful of entities that seem to be late in completing their financial statements every year. And some of them are like one thing, like the Heritage Fund. So every year they're over six months late. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with a trust, usually it's just one it's one one thing, and the people in the who that looks after the trust gives you that financial background. Why does it take? Why is it always late, over six months? You know, because I've dealt with trusts in my in my other job when I used to be uh, chief of the Salt River First Nation, and uh, and it was a bunch of larger trusts, like eighty nine million, and uh, I'm just wondering, you know. For, with the Heritage Fund, it's not that big, and uh, the interest is low, first of all, and you have it invested in this one, at one place, I imagine. Uh, I don't know what the, what the place is right now, but anyways. Uh, why does it take so long to uh, get a financial statement from the Heritage Fund and uh, BDIC? What, what is the holdup? Those are those are government entities. Uh, could you just explain, please? Thank you. Thank you, Amalia Martinez, Controller General. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in Appendix A of the financial statement discussion analysis section of the public accounts, we include um, all of the entities, um, their due dates, and whether they requested an extension, and then what their actual completion date was. Um, in terms of BDIC, they have a number of subsidiaries that they have to um, have audited statements for and then they consolidate uh, in together, uh, so that can take some time. Um, and then maybe I'll just uh, ask Celestino if he has anything else he'd like to add. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rowe? All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, a couple of additional items with regards to BDIC. Um, you will recall that in the 2021 public accounts, uh, the inventories uh, for those um, entities, subsidiaries, um, could not be audited as a result of restrictions in travel. So in 2022, um, one of the additional procedures that needed to be made was to try to go back and analyze 
um, to make sure that what was reported in those years, uh, the continuity schedule had to be made sure that it was accurate or as accurate as it could be and there wasn't a need to restatement. Um, luckily, uh, there were no issues with the inventory was what the auditors uh, did indicate on that item. However, that additional uh, requirement did add time and, uh, and uh, a need for a, a bit of a delay uh, from BDIC. Uh, so those are the additions I do. Did you want me to talk about the Heritage Fund? Sure. Um, so for the Heritage Fund, um, usually what we do is we get the Department of Finance to finish their departmental report. And after they have completed the departmental report, they uh, then turn around and, and look at the Heritage Fund. Additionally, in 2022, um, there were a number of questions that we raised as part of our preliminary review of the Heritage Fund. Um, so we had some initial discussions with our auditors uh, and asked them to go back and do additional work this year. Um, we had some questions about how to properly disclose um, the portfolio. Um, so they did have to go back and do a bit of extra work. Uh, so we know that that added some time to their audit. Um, and uh, we, uh, I recall uh, making sure that uh, they were still in compliance and, and following up with them to, to make sure that our questions were satisfied. So that was one of the items that added, uh, even prior to us getting the, uh, the full finalized version of the audit, we did get a preliminary review and we had some questions that we had, we made them follow up on. So that added some time to the Heritage Fund this year. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow up, Emily Martellus? On that particular thing, but I also wanted to ask another question with regards to uh, BDIC. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, it was uh, the interest, and in, they didn't charge any interest, and um, and the principal for uh, uh, some months, and then they uh, went back and uh, charged the interest. Uh, on to the principal after that. So a lot of the small businesses that took advantage of that uh, grace period because of all the businesses closing down, all of a sudden have all this interest that was added on to their principal. Was there any explanation given to uh, given to the Controller General about their actions by finance? Thank you, Comptroller General. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that's not something that would typically um, come through my office, but um, I'll just ask Celestino if he has anything else to add to that. Thank you, Mr. O. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we did have a, a look when we were compiling the consolidated accounts as to some of the variances and. Uh, uh, BDIC did respond to us in terms of there were some timing questions and some of it was relating to the fact that the government had asked for a pause to allow small businesses to um, have, as you mentioned, a grace period so that the cash flow um, could be accommodated. However, that was not uh, that was not a cancellation of the original agreement and, the, and and so forth. So, once that grace period was over, we said, okay, we're going to re we revert back to the original agreement, and therefore now there's a, a, a necessary period for catch up that had to be done. So, um, again, that the pause was provided to allow cash flow uh, challenges to be overcome. Once that was done and completed, then we revert back to the original agreement. And the original agreement does have interest on the principal that needs to be cut. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, any further questions from the committee? Emily Marcellus? Uh, maybe uh, that is kind of deceiving, okay, uh, to, uh, to people in small business, uh, because I had a lot of complaints about that in my area. And I'm sure across the territories, they, they, it's a consequence. I mean, people would probably would have preferred to keep on paying if that was the case, making it sound like they were doing something for small business and then doing the opposite and adding that all on at the end when people are just trying to recover is not okay. But I will tell the minister that in a statement in the house on the floor because uh, I've had a lot of complaints about that, okay? Because it's a, a deceiving thing. Uh, uh, I, and I'd like to see a comparison 
uh, uh, what the other provinces did and across Canada. Because up here, small business just most of the times just barely are, are just barely making it because of the population and uh, not having the same uh, same crowds to uh, draw on for uh, to survive. And uh, th this is what happens. And uh, going out and making a big public thing and putting out a news release saying that they're doing all these things and then turning around and doing the opposite in the end. Most businesses would have preferred just to keep on going and have get, been given that option. Okay? And uh, that is not okay because uh, it's the small business that carry everything in the north, uh, the smaller businesses. It's certainly in government. We do, do we depend on government? But government is a major factor uh, because they, they don't run like a business. The check still comes in the mail, right? And uh, that's not the way it works with small business. And it was very deceiving, but I, I will take it up with the minister also. Thank you, uh, Emily Martellus. Any comment, comfort on the ground? Perhaps, Emily Cleveland, can I perhaps confirm whether you are on the line? Uh, Mr. Chair, can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. Go ahead, Emily Cleveland. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first question I wanted to, to speak to is in regards to uh, relation liabilities. Uh, this is a subject that we've brought up multiple times or every year with the, the Office of the Comptroller General, and just concerns over the continued rise of um, the litigation liabilities of the GWT. Um, one of the things I've noted is that while we look at the estimated litigation liabilities of um, the GNWT, when we, when we ask about this number, we're always told it's an estimate, not an actual. But I'm wondering then why the uh, following year's public accounts doesn't kind of reconcile that number and provide the actuals of litigation so that we have that snapshot of yes, it was estimation, but this is what the actuals were every year um, for the, the liability or the litigation rather of the GMWT. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Emily Cleveland. Uh, we did hear you, but it, it appears every time you move your phone or something, it becomes extremely loud. So just when you speak next time, uh, try to be very still. Uh, but uh, over to you, Comptroller General. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe the member's referring to note 20D, which is the claims and litigation um, on page 39. Um, so one of the things we heard from committee uh, last time was the growing, um, was a concern around the growing number here. Um, and so what we've done this year is added in a section where we actually include um, the amount that's been accrued for claims and litigation. And so just, you know, stepping back a bit, the $151 million here is, you know, any claim that's been made against the government at the, at the total claim amount, at the maximum amount. This uh, claim uh, is not determinable that any future event will, will happen, um, and so therefore it's not something that we've actually booked in the financial statements. We've disclosed it here, um, but we haven't actually booked it as a liability. But what we did do this year was we included um, the amount that has been recorded as a liability, um, because this is any claim or litigation where it's likely there will be a future payment and is reasonable to estimate that amount. And that amount is $2.7 million. Um, and then this year we also provided nature of the claims uh, of the $151 million, um, just to give an idea uh, to the reader of what these claims, um, what these categories are. But so this year we did add uh, a little more to this note just to specifically you know, let a reader know what's been included in the liability section of the financial statement related to this. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow-up, Emily Cleveland? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My apologies for moving around. I'm going to try to not move around this time. <laughs> um, in, in regards to, to legal matters and litigations, um, 
given that it, this is a public government, you know, and we're dealing with public dollars and that we have to be accountable to the rather residents of the Northwest Territories, one of the things that people want to know is that when, when dollars are spent, um, you know, in, in some people's view unnecessarily um, and, and could have been prevented and you better use somewhere else that that there are lessons learned and potentially policy or process changes that happen as a result and so is the office of the controller general willing to um add in a section in regards to kind of lessons learned or a separate area where people can find lessons learned in regards to um litigation i know there's confidentiality when it comes to legal matters um, and I understand that piece of it, but the piece that might not be so uh, confidential is is the action that comes out of that in the end. And I'm wondering if there's room for improvement there. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and you were much clearer that time. Uh, over to you, Comptroller General. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, uh, that's something that we're, you know, I'm, I'm willing to take back and see what, you know, further detail we can add here or, um, you know, potentially to maybe another section, but um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I think that's also something committee has to take up with the Department of Justice. I'll, I'll note this year we paid the government of New Brunswick $2.57 million and then there was an NDA to sign between two public governments and they wouldn't tell us any facts about why two public governments were sending each other millions of dollars over a bridge that was built 20 years ago. So it, it can be frustrating for us to try and track what actually is coming out of that money. Uh, any further questions, comments from committee? Uh, I had a question about uh, what the Comptroller General views as the biggest barriers to perhaps speeding up the timeline of the public accounts. And, and I guess I, you know, I, I, there's these entities that are consistently later than others and, and the BDIC I get, you know, has to wait for its subsidiaries. But to me, it seems hilarious that, you know, the Ula Huk Tuk Arts and Crafts Center, which materialities, no matter what they are doing is going to be completely irrelevant to the, the whole public accounts, has to be audited first before BDIC can report, before you guys can do your work, before the Auditor General can. And, um, I imagine the federal government has even more subsidiaries that, you know, have more things have to be rolled up. So I, I, I'm wondering if there's some sort of process like we could look at whether some of those entities just don't, really, you know, if they're late, they're late and we could perhaps prepare or start things further. Yeah, so any insight into what the delays are and whether some of those smaller ones are really necessary to wait for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, certainly every year when we're planning uh, the year-end process, we look at where we can find efficiencies and where we can speed up certain things. Um, we don't necessarily always are waiting for one before the other. So, you know, while entities are working on their year-end, we are working on the GNWT and so department submissions um, and working with departments to have that consolidated. Um, and then those schedules done. So we do try to, uh, you know, as best as possible to find our efficiencies. Um, and then, you know, but there are some larger entities like if the Housing Corporation, for example, um, with the 23 local housing authorities that have to be audited and consolidate in, and then that's audited, and then we consolidate it in. So there are some, some stepping stones for sure. Um, it's on our radar to, you know, we've, We've seen committees report from the last review of the public accounts. Um, you know, committees looking for a response to that, the timing. Um, it's a conversation we need to have. But of course, um, it will be difficult to substantially change the timing um, without, you know, maybe some transformative changes. So, uh, you know, we, we continue to do, find our efficiencies um, and certainly, you know, work very well with departments and the Office of the Auditor General to, um, you know, make things as efficient as possible. And I think we do a great job of that. Um, and we just continue to look for where we can find some improvements and maybe um, some changes to, to speed that up. And I'll just ask uh, Celestino if he'd like to add anything. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O. Uh, thank you. As the Comptroller General mentioned, uh, we do look to see where we can speed up the process as, as best as we can. Um, however, one of the things that we've noted is that um, where, where we have taken some effort uh, we've seen some erosion because of items outside of the contro our control. Um, one example that I'll provide for 2022 
was uh, the flood in Air River uh, had an impact on some of our larger subsidiaries, such as uh, MTS, that needed to be audited um, and so forth. So they did uh, have a, a delay, which uh, because MTS is a larger uh, component of the government, therefore it does did have a, an effect on us. Uh, so uh, where we are able to find um, improvements or processes, we have, like I said, in the last two years, unfortunately, first where there was COVID and then 2022, there was uh, a flood uh, issue to do with. So, uh, we try to, we, we do need to leave a bit of uh, room, obviously, for contingencies, and we're mindful of that. So, those were the additions I wanted to. Thank you. Uh, any further questions, comments from the committee? Emily Simpson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to talk about, uh, I guess, uh, you know, what uh, residents uh, are concerned about. Uh, yeah, at least in my writing and probably throughout the uh, NWT and, and that's like you know we're we see the cost of living rise rising we see you know groceries rising we see you know uh, f uh, fuel prices uh, transportation all that and on top of it we see the uh, an increase in uh, in debt with this with this government and that debt if it's not paid off by the uh, federal government's got to be paid off on the backs of uh, you know, biz, uh, northern businesses and uh, residents. So I guess the question I have is, with an increasing net debt position, uh, do you see anything this government can be doing on the accounting side to identify and correct shortcomings that would work towards identifying solutions to debt reduction? Thank you. Thank you, Comptroller General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so our, our liabilities are showing um, our obligations that are from past transactions, so from decisions that have already been made. And so we're providing you with what um, with, with, with that picture looks like based on the decisions up to now. Um, so really, I think, you know, the question you're asking um, sounds like it's more around decisions regarding fiscal policy and, and future spending decisions. And so that would fall um, outside of my mandate, but um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any follow-up, Emily Simpson? No, no, thank you. Any further questions, comments from committee? Hearing none, uh, on behalf of the committee, we would like to thank you for all of your work preparing for public accounts. Uh, we look forward to your response and the department's response to our last report, and we will prepare our next report. And thank you everyone for attending today. I will sign off.